Dragon Midnight here with another special report. I'm new to the Xenoblade series, though not the Japanese RPGs and not to the game's spiritual predecessors Xenogears and Xenosaga. Of course, all three series are mostly unconnected, apart from some shared themes and fan service like Cosmos showing up as a rare blade in Xenoblade 2. And all three are proper space operas, as melodramatic as pro wrestling and twice as violent. But I'll get to that in a bit. What's interesting about Xenoblade is that the trilogy is only loosely connected. All three share the same universe, but each one starts fresh with brand new characters. The same man, Tetsuya Takahashi, created all three series, and his fingerprints can be found all over the Gears, Saga, and Blade franchises. And while Xenoblade fans will definitely pick up on some overarching themes in a similar setting, unlike Xenosaga, you can jump it at any point and not be lost. My own entry point, Xenoblade Chronicles 3, takes place on Ionios, where warring nations Keeves and Agnes have been battling so long that the why no longer matters. Keeves specializes in mechanical technology, while Agnes excels in a type of magic known as Aether and each faction bioengineers soldiers for a maximum 10-year lifespan. With each year known as Terms, the soldiers endeavor to survive the endless warfare and make it to the end of their decade of service, after which they're reabsorbed by the queen who created them, allegedly returning to heaven. So basically, they try to not die over a 10-year period, at the end of which the reward is death. And like every tyranny that celebrates martial valor, it's considered a great honor to give their lives for the cause especially if they can make it to the so-called homecoming ceremony, the event marking 10 years of service where they're ceremonially killed. Xenoblade 3 initially follows three members of Spec Ops, Noah, Lands, and Uni, devout soldiers of Keeves who never question their role or the nature of their existence until Noah begins having reservations. The ninth year is what's known as an Offseer, someone who ceremonially mourns those lost in the battlefield occasionally for both sides. And whether it's battlefield trauma, or the only clear goal of the fighting, which is capturing the enemy's life force to power their colony's flame clock, in the hopes of receiving a homecoming ceremony at the end of their tenth term. Whatever it is, Noah begins feeling like something is… off. And when they come across an Agnian squad consisting of Mio, Sena, and Tyon, and a man who's inexplicably lived for 60 years appears, babbling about some shared enemy, who appears and attacks both the Kivesi and Agnian squads, the characters are thrown into an existential crisis. And if you think that's convoluted, woo, that's just the first few hours. From there, you're tossed headfirst into an epic melodrama involving clones, parallel universes, reincarnation, and our own mortality. I wouldn't dare spoil the rest, though if I'm being honest, the biggest rug pull happens at the beginning when the opposing squads realize they need to work together to deal with a common enemy, unraveling the secret fabric of their very existence. As for the battle system, it'll seem familiar to Xenoblade veterans, but a culture shock for newbies who cut their teeth on Xenogears and Xenosaga. The third Xeno series foregoes a turn-based system in favor of a semi-action system where you have full control over the main character at all times, who can either auto-attack with their squad mates, or perform special attacks known as arts. At a certain point, the characters can merge into a larger form called Ouroboros, giving them stronger abilities, and you also need to take into account tactics, which allow you to issue orders to party members, and roles, which are broken down into attacker, defender, and healer. And if all of that sounds convoluted, it is. Very much so. The game bombards you with tutorials, and in a few instances there's tutorials to guide you through tutorials. You might say the learning curve is steep, overly complicated, and it's a shame because the game tells a fine story, to a point. The overall motifs of free will, loss, grief, and purpose strike a chord, but when it goes off the rails it's like Bonzi jumped the shark before climbing into a fridge to survive an A-bomb and it was all a dream. I've read that Xenoblade 3's characters are the most relatable of the trilogy, but first off, I can only imagine how wacky the last two games get. And while some of the third game's broader themes are familiar, its sci-fi excesses are anything but grounded. With its over-the-top action, colorful characters, and extreme melodrama, it reminded me a bit too much of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. I mean, there's even an enemy in one of the games called a Zord. 
This sort of anime-flavored hyper-sci-fi melodrama definitely has its fans, and so I'm not altogether surprised Xenoblade 3's topped many lists of the top RPGs of 2022. Put it this way, if you enjoyed Metal Gear Solid 2's slow descent into madness, the Xenoblade 3's wackiness will barely phase you. It's just not for me. I guess I've been spoiled with more grounded tales like The Last of Us, but then again, I love vintage JRPGs like Final Fantasy VI, Chrono Trigger, Final Fantasy Tactics, and even Xenogears, but Xenoblade 3 is just one jump the shark moment too many for me. So I rate Xenoblade Chronicles 3, three snazzy spoons out of five. Thanks for joining me for another special report. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to my televisual program, and I'll see you next time. This is Jimmy Midnight signing off.